taken up with the session. So now, audience, we are in our panel discussion two for the day, that is managing international trademark portfolios in the age of globalization. We have our co-panelists joining in, Arturo Ishpag Gonzalez, Senior Corporate Counsel, The Legal Group. We have Michael Sharp, Senior Legal Counsel and Head of Intellectual Property, Aurora Cannabis. We have Rajeshwari Hari Haran, founder Rajeshwari and Associates. We also have Dine, she will be joining up and she's uh, Dine Gable Pratt, Senior Intellectual Property Counsel, Seagate Technology. And we have, the interesting thing about uh, this session is that we have two moderators, that is we have Ellis Flacco, Deputy General Counsel, Microcode, CRM, and we have Natasha Wilwin Robinson, Senior Legal Counsel and Philanthropist Progress. So, here you go. So, over to you all. Okay. Thanks so much for the intro. So, I'll let you start, Natasha, and I can jump in. Sure. Hi, my name is Natasha Walwin Robinson. I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I work for a global technology company called Progress Software. We specialize in um, software for IT departments and developers across the world. And my role is intellectual property, uh, litigation, employment, and a bit of procurement. Um, so if we could go around and just do a brief introduction as well, uh, we could start with you, Michael. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Sharp. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I'm currently the Senior Legal Counsel and Head of Intellectual Property at Aurora Cannabis, Inc. And uh, prior to that, I had worked uh, about 12 years in private practice focusing in on um, IP prosecution, both on the patents and the trademark side, and uh, happy to be here. Great. Arturo? Hello, everyone. My name is Arturo Vizlat, and I'm from Mexico City. I'm on the senior corporate counsel of the Lego Group. Uh, I do manage the uh, intellectual property rights of the company for the Latin American region. Uh, so almost, uh, I, I'll do like a Framework prosecution and also like a few uh, framework important. Uh, happy to join. Okay. Rajeshwari. Yeah. So uh, I'm Rajeshwari and uh, I'm the founder of Rajeshwari and Associates. We are a law firm in uh, New Delhi and uh, we are a boutique law firm that does patent filing, trademark filing, prosecution. And uh, our focus of our practice is uh, litigation. So we do a lot of litigation on uh, IP matters, uh, contentious matters with regard to um, pharmaceuticals and uh, the Internet of Things. So that's what that's the that's the kind of facts that we do. Thank you. And Alice, how about yourself? Yeah, um, I am uh, Alice Flacco, so Deputy General Counsel of uh, an international medical device and healthcare um, biotechnology company. I deal with uh, all kinds of legal issues worldwide. I have this luck that's so very varied. And recently, I took over the Department of uh, Intellectual Property and R and D department. So that's very very interesting and. Uh, I uh, I was trained in law firms, uh, so it's it's pretty interesting to pass from law firm to private equity firms to healthcare. But so far, I'm having a lot of fun in healthcare. <laughs> Excellent. Poor Diane, I think she's still stuck in a loop. Um, still waiting for the for to get in. Maybe we can already start with the questions. I think okay. maybe we should wait for Diane, maybe. Yeah. I see that she's a bit stuck. Yeah. So, what uh, for for the uh, for the audience that is listening? I see we have uh, seventeen people. We decided that we will need this uh, panel in the form of a round table, which is more interactive, so like that everybody can benefit more of a discussion on our own um, way of dealing with, um, with 
be key topics right now in our own companies and in our own work, everyday work. So we, um, I will start from like what we do around you know, of how we deal with uh, with key topics and key issues right now, including COVID, and of course the changes that this has brought. Hopefully that will be uh, interesting for the audience and to hear more of that presentation more of, of like, you know, really uh, case studies and, uh, and some really concrete stories and experiences from our daily life. So maybe I can start from Rajaswari. Um, yeah, sure. How uh, would you say if, how would you say that COVID-19 has changed your uh, management uh, portfolio strategy if it has changed it? Yeah, so uh, on account of this uh, pandemic, you know, we've been uh, witnessing a number of uh, changes in the way things are going on uh, with respect to the patent and trademark offices. First of all, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as everywhere else in the world, our trademark office also has uh, relaxed the deadlines. So the limitation with regard to various activities has been suspended. So, but that does not mean that, of course, uh, that there are no activities going on. Uh, companies are continuing to file trademark applications. Though we find that there is a, a crunch, there is a resource crunch, and there is a perhaps budget crunch. So where a company might file 500 applications, they might just file about also witnessing that uh, during these uh, uh, during these months uh, there are a number of uh, changes in the businesses itself so people are uh, so if it's an alcohol industry they're opening a wing for making sanitizers masks and so on and so there are three new trademarks which are coming up in that area another uh, thing that I'm observing uh, in the last few months is uh, the increase in the number of uh, problems in the social media and the online platforms. So while you don't have uh, so much of counterfeiting in the physical world, you do have them. So there is the number of there is counterfeiting in the in the physical world as well. But the <clears throat> online counterfeiting is much higher now than it was because uh, people are not able to sell otherwise and they have to go to the online world. So we are encountering a number of that. And uh, very surprisingly, we are finding people to uh, start off new, uh, new, you know, fake Facebook pages, fake uh, pages on uh, Twitter, uh, fake uh, Twitter handles. And uh, so that's another problem because uh, intermediaries always say that no, we are not responsible. You have to monitor it yourself. So you have to literally have one person just to monitor this on a daily basis. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages which are created. Another big problem that we did encounter is with respect to, well, even Facebook pages you can sort of monitor. You have uh, uh, apps like uh, Telegram. Telegram, uh, you might be knowing, is an app which you, which people are, which is very popular with people. So they have uh, private and public channels. So if you control the public channels, then the private channels, they, they, there are private channels, and it's difficult to control them. So all I'm saying is the online uh, menace, the counterfeiting online, is becoming a very big uh, menace, as 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 we see, you know, in the past uh, few uh, months. And uh, we are also what we are also seeing is there is an a, there is an increase in the number of marks uh, that are not used. So there is a very period where people are unable to sell certain products. So it becomes a period of non-use. So that's another troublesome factor that we see. So these are some of the issues that we are uh, encountering. Fortunately, the um, high court. And the district courts in India are now all uh, adapted to the virtual world. So we are all having, um, you know, virtual uh, hearings on a daily basis. The Delhi High Court has taken the lead in this. 
and uh, as soon as we have certain uh, counterfeits we can always report it to the delhi high court we can get injunctions we can get orders of that nature but that's only the high court the other law enforcement agencies such as the cyber appeal tribunal or the police are not that active so where you would want them also to be equally active that 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 is slightly uh, sort of uh, you know lagging behind so these are some of the things that i thought uh, you know i would uh, flag and highlight so much that was very interesting and um i that that's pretty uh, um yeah funny because i was also talking to a colleague and friend who told me exactly the same thing about facebook pages that it was so like totally uh unmanageable thing and uh it's driving like really yeah it's 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 a, it's a key topic for now like right now and thanks for bringing it up um, and i believe that with all with this like climate there are also a lot of um restructuring including also mna um uh, mergers and acquisition of course like um entire company that i'm being sold um and this also can determine a swift in how trademarks are acquired or divested and this brings me to the question and of in this m a that i would love to ask to natasha because i believe that you deal with this for quite frequently if you if you would like that natasha but i wonder how in this m a context how does your company are you and, and your company assets with trademarks acquire or divest and how do you handle all the related um issue of uh trademark evaluation sure so at progress we have a fairly aggressive growth strategy for example in the past four years that i've been at progress as in-house counsel we've acquired four companies so that's on average a company a year and so with each company, as we're evaluating um, what we call the target in the initial uh, diligence stage, a lot of the work is to identify which intellectual property assets we'd like to hold on to or possibly transfer or do something else with. And trademarks, of course, are part of that portfolio. Um, so what that really involves is a collaborative approach across the legal department, um, typically in some you'll see intellectual property lawyers are kind of a specialty within the legal department and may not necessarily always be engaged from the onset in certain transactions. But what I advocate for in m and progress is that the IP team, myself, and with their legal um, are involved from the outset of the transaction and we're asking the right questions. Um, and so we provide a checklist of questions to the deal team who's um, leading the transaction, as well as our corporate development team who interacts with the target and their stakeholders regularly to ensure that we're covering um, the concerns we have. Uh, the, the key things about trademarks um, and along with other IP assets is we want to know if they're in company anyway. Um, are there any security interests attached to them? Are there issues with ownership um, with the target that are, may not um, be clear so we try to get a sense of that, um, if the target is willing to disclose it early on and um, evaluate then how we want to handle those trademarks. Um, if they have an international portfolio, we try to see where um, each trademark um, application, let's say, is in the stage of prosecution or if they've been granted already, again, the ownership rights. So we, we do a full-fledged, essentially audit um, to really determine what, what they have before we um, decide to take it on. And once we've done that analysis um, as a team, then we will um, provide our feedback to the lead M&A um, attorney and corporate development team. Um, and, and they have that information to determine how they want to proceed on that piece. Um, in the present case, we recently acquired, um, or we're in the process of acquiring Chef Software. We announced this early in September. And so we're at the stage now where um, 
we are gathering information about um, which foreign associates we need to work with moving forward um, to handle any global um, trade talks we have, and then also confirming which outside counsel will we, will we want to work with if we want to work with our own. Um, or to continue working with the Target's um, Trademark Council. So there's a lot of elements, and, and to your point earlier, um, COVID adds some wrinkles to, to the process, um, but it really is a team effort. Um, and advocating that IP again be considered early on uh, in the deal. Thank you so much. Well, from what I hear, it's very exciting. We kind of have a lot to do in that aspect. And, uh, you have also a very, very solid team because it really requires coordination with stakeholders and, and also different teams. And, and what, I, what I've been interested in, in uh, lately is also because we manufacture products, uh, been interested pretty much in product design. And I was thinking about you, Michael, because of your expertise, I would love to understand like how, what kind of factors do you consider when you seek the protection of product design through, for example, trade dress or design patents or boats? That's very interesting for me to understand because I will have to dig into that in more detail. So having the, the, the experience of an expert which knows much, much better than me, that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Arturo may have more practical um, knowledge on this, and, and I assume he's going to discuss it after, after me. Uh, but I, I find these non-traditional marks really interesting, and um, three-dimensional marks as an example. And so the general strategy isn't isn't anything controversial or any sort of rocket science. You know, we look at design protection on the front end in the short term and and sort of lock up that type of protection whether it's a design patent in the US or, or we call them industrial design registrations in Canada and and then that gives you 10 or 15 years depending on the jurisdiction to acquire distinctiveness and use you know use that uh, shape design that trade dress in, in order to um, to again you know get that identified by the consumer to a level where you could you could start to register it as a non-traditional trademark and i know that's very different country to country and in canada we would call it a distinguishing guys or, or something like that um so i do find it interesting we have we have some design cases that we're looking at now um that we, we hope acquire distinctiveness as we use it and in our industry uh, some of the shapes of our products uh, well we're, we're in a very heavily regulated industry and so we're even restricted uh, by, for example, the Cannabis Act in ca in Canada, how we can how we can design our products. And for example, uh, we can't design we can't create a product in a certain shape that would be more appealing to children or youth than it would be to an adult. Uh, and and you can understand the reasons behind that. But um, when people think about cannabis gummies they'll often think of gummy bears and that type of thing. And that's, we, we can't do that. That's not a legal uh, uh, shape that we can do. And certainly it wouldn't be something proprietary either. So do they, sorry to interrupt, do they do this quite often? Because it's, <laughs> I think that, that yeah. It's, yeah. Kind of well, yes, the, the legal, you know, illegal products will come in a variety of different shapes, but that, that is something that's quite common. Uh, you know, cannabis gummy bears That's are amazing. fairly well <laughs> on the illicit market and on the legal market, you know, we're restricted to, to quite boring shapes, but there's no reason why we can't uh, have those shapes become an identifier of our goods and, and our company over time. And that's what we're hoping to do. But uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Arturo has more to say uh, as far as experience goes. Much, Michael. Thank you so much. It's very interesting, sharp, and efficient. Very straightforward. Yeah, Artur, I'm happy to know. Like, really, really interested in your also in your experiences. Artur, I think you're still muted. Try it again. Yes. Okay. Good. Now, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, non-traditional trademarks are like very important for, for us in, in Latin America, uh, but they are kind of new. Uh, for instance, in Mexico, we didn't have them until the 
we don't have like a lot of uh, registrations yet, uh, like for like uh, take marks and uh, 3D trademarks. Even before we had trade dress, we had the protection for 3D trademarks. And now that we have trade dress, we have to to show acquire some of them. In other countries like Chile, for instance, where we also have businesses, uh, we haven't found that not even three trademarks are protected. So we have to, to deal with different kinds of countries where uh, in some of them uh, there's like protection for, for trade dress or for non distinctive trademarks, and for others, for others they don't even have like three trademarks at all. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of difficult, and that, that's why you have to be like creative when finding new trademarks so you know what to do in case you don't have like a protection there for instance uh, in chile we have applied for bidimensional marks uh, which is the similar like a design mark uh, because they don't have three trademarks so, so this is something that we have to to do like uh, from time to time uh, in, in different countries okay yeah that's very important to see how actually the geographic location as well influence how you manage your international trademark portfolio. Natasha, does it happen as well, like in your company, that the nature and how the, does the nature of your company or industry or geographic location influence the way you guys manage your, your, your trademark portfolio? Uh, well, we are identify ourselves as being part of the technology industry. And to Rajesh Wari's earlier point, a lot of what we're seeing now is we have to be more vigilant about policing what's going on online. Um, we have seen um, an increase in um, infringement, uh, use of our brand um, on social media, different sites popping up here and there, all over the place. Um, and so uh, going back to the theme, uh, we do have um, product engineers and product teams who have set Google alerts for their respective technology products in the company. So um, to the extent they see anything, they can notify my team. Um, so they share in some of helping us identify um, some of those um, issues. And then uh, we really uh, rely, because we're on a technology company, we rely on technology tools to help us to manage our portfolio. And so we are always looking for um, new tools or better ways to use the tools we have to help us to organize our database and stay on top of filing deadlines and renewals and, and things of that nature. So um, yeah, the technology industry is very dynamic and keeps you on your toes <laughs> in terms of keeping things together. That's great. And uh, for example, how um, when you license and maybe the experience of Arturo and Michael would be relevant as well here to to what ex to what extent you guys engage in licensing on, of your trademarks on an international scale. Sure, I, I can make some initial comments. Um, you know, we have a, a couple of different situations where internationally, sometimes we have a wholly owned subsidiary internationally, or, or in some cases partially owned, or in other cases, completely independent parties. And so you can imagine you might handle those relationships a little bit differently, um, get into different levels of, of due diligence and understanding that you're you're dealing with a party you can trust with with your marks and with your brands, and will live up to the quality standards that um, that that you want to have reflect uh, your company. And so, something I found interesting on uh, the licensing, even to related. Um, wholly owned subsidiaries, if they're international, uh, at least this is the way it works in Canada, there's there's tax implications and transfer pricing implications where you, you think you would be able to let a, a, a foreign subsidiary use your marks um, at a, on a non-royalty free uh, or a non-royalty basis for free and then whatever it might be. But you really do have to have to paper it and practice it in a manner as if it's an arm's length party. And that's, uh, you know, partially for IP reasons. You do want to show you, you as the mark owner have control over how it's being used by even a related entity, but also, you know, tax reasons and, and a lot of other reasons that, that aren't necessarily IP. So 
um, I found I found that interesting, and uh, I don't think there's any real way around it. Uh, and ultimately, it's it serves everybody um, best to to properly paper uh, a license with a foreign company, whether it's related or not related. Uh, yeah, I was saying in my case, we all have a lot of licenses. Uh, like we have Star Wars, we have a, like uh, now we have Adidas, uh, we have a lot of licenses. However, since we are Danish uh, company. All of the licenses are had with uh, to the Danish company. Uh, however, when you when I do file like, people using uh, our marks in an in an unauthorized way, sometimes they contact me. Uh, like I, I wouldn't say the name, but like some motor companies, uh, some books. Uh, like a lot of companies are using our mini figure figurine in the cover of the books uh, to make some appeal to the people who buy cars and everything like that. And when I just send them, I think this is better. They usually come back asking for a license, and uh, please no, because we are very careful regarding the licenses that we we give. So uh, all the like given our and and uh, so we, we don't have a lot of room to negotiate licenses here. It maybe doesn't make sense because we could have uh, we could make some money from the licenses in other countries like there are like some. Uh, Pizza shop just contacted us a big one asking us uh, to give them the license to, to use our mini paper figurines uh, for the uh, for the gifts that they that they give like 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 McDonald's and everything. However, we are like very restrictive about that. And also, I have found that many uh, like non NGOs are asking uh, are asking for our permission to use our mini figures in animated videos uh, like in a positive way that. Now with the COVID-19, they, they want to use the mini figures to educate people uh, to go back to, to the kind of the normal life, the normal life, also for children to wash their hands and everything. However, even when I find things like a positive, uh, the, the company is very conservative regarding And I argue that this is a positive to do. They just decide not to do it because uh, they just, they are, they have like a, like a semaphore where, where it restricts where can we use the trademark and where can we cannot use it? So, so this is what I can, uh, this is my input regarding licenses. Thank you. That's, uh, I see that I have fun in healthcare, but you guys, I think that's, <laughs> that's even better. So, I, I, I think Natasha did the rest of the session. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Um, Rajas Mori, did you want to chime in for a minute? Yeah. Uh, what we are now observing is that there are a number of, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, like Indian companies used to have their products distributed in uh, other countries to their distributors. So uh, one thing, and and of course we used to have, uh, you know, uh, foreign companies who didn't have a presence here. They used to uh, sell their products in India to distributors or franchisees or otherwise. So we are increasingly finding that uh, these Indian distributors or even otherwise outside are facing two problems. Uh, I mean, the companies are facing two problems, the brand owners. Uh, one problem is that they find that the distributor starts to register the trademarks on his own without the consent of the brand innovator. So that's a problem. That was a problem in the physical world as well. But now that's on a larger scale. And uh, the problem is uh, accentuated by the fact that uh, it's now online. So it's done through perhaps, I would say, faceless, undiscoverable systems and means. And uh, the products are sold online. So it's very difficult to get through that to that uh, distributor or to that guy. And this, while this is one problem, some of them are just going bust. So you might have placed orders, and you must, have, or you know, certain orders must have been executed, but you're unable to recover it. I see. So that's another big problem that's coming up. So these are two major issues that we have been seeing in the last few months. Sure. And um, Diane, if you, thank you. Uh, we're happy you could could make it. And yeah, let's try you, it. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. And and. Um, could you introduce yourself and give us a brief um, breakdown of, of your role and your part sure. of your so, 
Yes, my name is Diane Gable Kratz. Most recently, I manage the global trademark portfolio for Seagate Technology, which is a data storage and hardware company uh, located in Silicon Valley. I'm looking for my next uh, position, so that hopefully that will be exciting. It's been a tough time with COVID, uh, but I wanted to just comment on, I think, domain name registration and how that dovetails with trademarks. That was something that I was hoping to speak with. I don't think it's been discussed. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but the comment I wanted to make. Okay, great. So what I wanted to, to say about that is, you know, there's so many domain names out there and we all try to protect our company by registering as many as we can, by registering variations, by getting all the different top level domains, .net, .biz, .us, .in, you know, whatever country we're in. But what we have to remember is that well-intentioned consumers know how to find us most of the time. These days, people are very practical. They're very savvy, you know, really worldwide, even people who we may not have thought of as being savvy in the past. So for example, for Seagate, if a customer's Seagate, they're probably either going to type seagate.com into the browser, or they will just search Seagate on Google, and that will be the very first thing that pops up. So even though you might want to register every single possible variation of Seagate, you really don't need to. You don't need to register Seagate as a company that I've heard of .biz, right? Because no one who's really looking for your genuine company is going to register that. Dilution is something that we are all concerned about as trademark attorneys, but if you have very limited options, limited resources, limited time, you know, just focus on your actual company name, your key brands, and the most legitimate kinds of top-level domains like the .com domain. Thanks. Thank you, excellent practical advice there. Um, so at this juncture, we wanted to turn it over to the audience to see if there are any questions. So I'll just give some time for the chat to catch up and see if anyone on the chat would like to, to ask any of those questions. So the first question we have is for Alice, and the question is from Nico. So he's asking, do you represent clients at the Strasbourg? Yes, we do. Um, I don't do personally because, as I am an uh, employee of the company, I, I cannot. Uh, I cannot uh, appear in court as a lawyer because uh, it's an incompatibility between like professional, uh, like liberal, liberal work and um, and uh, any employee status. But yes, we do. Yeah, through our law firm, of course, we always uh, help them draft the briefs and monitor what's going on. I'd be happy to ask. Um, just wanted to comment, uh, and I'm not sure what other opinions people shared about how COVID was affecting their strategy. Uh, before the large layoff where I was coming most recently, I have to say it was not significantly affecting my trademark strategy. We had not been given explicit instructions, reduced budgets. Uh, we were still focusing on plugging some holes in our portfolio, particularly with filings in China and also continuing to work with customs officials in various countries, submitting customs modules and trying to help familiarize those agents with our brand and with how to identify counterfeits. So for me personally, at least up until very recently, I was not changing my COVID, uh, you know, my trademark strategy in light of COVID. So then I have a question for you. So in, in these times, has uh, the, uh, uh, you know, counterfeiting and uh, stuff like that increased, or do you find that uh, the same as it was earlier? Uh, so far, up until most recently, I had not noticed a significant increase, um, but I imagine that that's also very dependent on particular industries. 
I would think that as the economy starts improving, that we would see probably an increase back to maybe more normal kind of stages. But again, a lot of it depends on whether counterfeiting and how lucrative is it and how practical, practical is it given the change that COVID has made to our various economies around the world. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, I was asking Diane whether, you know, people were investing more in uh, cloud technology. Is that the trend that she is finding? Well, I imagine there's been a general trend for that. But remember, the underlying cloud, you still have to have the, the farms basically with hard drives or with SSDs to power all of that. So at least uh, as of what I last year, we were still doing okay uh, at my former company at Seagate Technology. And I should add, I'm, I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of that company, of course, you know, but I think those are some things it's fair to share about the industry. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I'm not sure if it was discussed, is a uh, trade dress. Did we talk about trade dress today? Well, I have to share. Okay. Excellent. Uh, just uh, one one perspective on trade dress versus design patents. That's something that come up, came up for me. I'm also a registered patent attorney and handled patent portfolios for two of our business units. And design patents I have found to be actually for our particular kinds of products much more effective than trade dress it's a lot easier to get a design patent at least in the, in the united states it's a lot faster of a process and i find enforcement to be smoother so often you have the option of doing both uh, you could do just trade dress you could do just design patents or both but just practically speaking and from a budgetary standpoint you know, my modus operandi has been simply to do design patents and not even though i am personally very and very comfortable with various kinds of protection. Well, I think that concludes our session today. And um, I, I want to thank you for your time and your pleasure for moderating with Alice today. Thank you to the all key panelists for joining for this session and thank you Alice and Natasha for you know moderating this wonderful session.